Welcome to the Plain Talk Podcast. I am your host, Rob Port. Later in the show, we're going to be hearing from Riley Kuntz. He is a, an, a local activist who is working on uh, a referendum effort to refer language limiting North Dakota's auditor to the statewide ballot. You'll hear all about that. Uh, in fact, some breaking news on that just before we recorded the interview. Senate Majority Re- Leader Rich Wardner said the legislature would not be calling themselves back into session to address the issue. So a referendum at this point is, is probably the only way that that's going to get fixed. Anyway, uh, before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about the smoking age. Now, the Fargo Forum had an editorial in, about this over the weekend, and they are in support of what an increasing number of counties in Minnesota have been doing, an increasing number of jurisdictions around the country have been doing, but essentially raising the age limit for tobacco use to 21. Now, I oppose this for multiple reasons, Uh, and the first reason is that I'm not sure that it's going to accomplish the thing that supporters think it's going to accomplish. Let's think about this for a moment. It's already been illegal for some time now to use tobacco products under the age of 18. Now, there may have been a a slight gap there when we're talking about vaping products, which are relatively new, and maybe they weren't specifically outlawed in code, but uh, let's just say that those loopholes were closed pretty quickly. Uh, If you are underage, if you are under the age of 18 and you want to use a tobacco product or a vaping product, note I made a distinction there, we'll talk about that in a moment, uh, it's been illegal. And yet, for the most part, students get away with it anyway. I remember when I was a kid attending Central High School in downtown Minot, uh, I saw kids, you know, smoking all the time. And sometimes the cops would make a sweep through and round some of them up and tickets would be issued and I'll tell you, it never, it didn't bother the kids that much. It didn't really deter anybody. I mean, they made some, uh, you know, sort of pro forma efforts to conceal what they were doing. But for the most part, kids who wanted to smoke, they smoked. And I have a feeling for younger generations, it hasn't been all that different. If anything, it's maybe gotten a little harder to smoke just because so f- so many fewer adults smoke that I think it's harder for kids to to hide it. Right. I mean, how do you hide the fact that your clothes smell like smoke if your parents don't smoke? I think that's got to be probably pretty tough. But, you know, for for the most part, kids who want to smoke are smoking. And so the idea is, as the Fargo Forum and other places uh, argue, the, the idea is, is that youth tobacco use is increasing. In fact, let me quote here from the forum. They write, I, I quote, alarmingly, youth tobacco use in Minnesota has risen for the first time in 17 years. They go on to say that 95% of addicted adult smokers start before age 21, and then they leap to this conclusion. Again, I quote, raising the tobacco sale age to 21 will reduce youth smoking and save lives. Well, how will banning adults from smoking, right? Because that's what people who are age 18 to 21 are under the law. They are adults. How does banning them from making a choice about smoking or vaping, as the case may be, impact youth smoking at all see the problem is is that youths who want to smoke or vape are already ignoring the law expanding the scope of the law isn't likely to to get more people to to abide by it as a matter of fact 18 to 21 year olds uh they're probably even more likely to ignore the law because hey they're adults it's a lot easier for them to ignore the law You know, at most, you're maybe going to inconvenience some people. But, I mean, let's face it. Again, for the most part, kids who want to smoke are smoking. Now, that's not an argument for getting rid of the underage 21, or excuse me, underage 18 tobacco law. I don't have a problem with that. But I just don't think that expanding it is going to accomplish anything. My other problem is when we say that tobacco use is going up, we're lumping vaping in with tobacco use, which is, well, it's... It just doesn't make any sense. Yet we do this all the time because the truth is, is that cigarette, you know, sort of traditional tobacco use and specifically cigarette use among young Americans has been in decline, has been for some time. I think we're at or near historic lows, depending on which part of the country you're looking at. What's gone up recently is vaping essentially what we've done in a lot of ways is we've exchanged youth smoking for youth vaping now i'm not really in favor of kids under the age of 18 vaping either vaping is not good for you it should be a decision you make as an adult 
But if we're going to exchange, if kids are going to smoke anyway, and we're going to exchange smoking for vaping, well, how, how can we not sit back and look at that as a net win for public health? I don't know any other way to look at it. Again, it's not necessarily good that kids under the age of 18 are vaping, but it's better than they're smoking. And again, if we have a problem with this, the kids who want to vote smoke, the kids who want to vape seem to be getting it anyway. So what are we doing? What bothers me about a lot, a lot of this is that I'm, I'm not sure that these policies are formulated in a way to address, to, to achieve the actual policy outcomes that supporters say that they want to achieve. I, I, I don't, I, I, I say that I, I don't doubt for a minute that people who are working in, you know, tobacco cessation or, or nicotine, whatever you want to call it, the anti-tobacco, anti-smoking, anti-vaping bureaucracy that's out there. I think they really do want people to quit. I sometimes wonder if they believe their own exaggerations about some of the the health dangers it's again it's not healthy but some of the some of the the rhetoric you get from that crowd is a little over the top but but frankly i think a lot of it's about job security because again tra- traditional tobacco use has gone down it's been replaced in a lot of ways by vaping and i think the you know the, the old guard of anti tobacco people the, the people who came up you know and sort of got a lot of their jobs during the tobacco settlement you know the, the national class action tobacco settlement lawsuit and that brought these huge influxes of dollars into states like North Dakota states like Minnesota and those dollars were used to hire a whole bunch of bureaucrats who dedicated their careers to fighting tobacco only now not a lot of people are smoking anymore or certainly a, a much smaller faction of the public is smoking today than were, you know, even 20, 30, 40 years ago. These people need something to do. And so now vaping is the thing that they want to do, which is why, you know, increasingly when they advocate for, you know, public policy changes to so like say the tax code or they advocate for, for changes such as who is allowed to buy vaping products, they use statistics and they use numbers and they lump vaping in with tobacco use because I think they just want it all to be the same thing for the sake of their jobs. I think they want it all to be the same thing for the sake of, you know, continuing to to maintain this bureaucracy that we've built. But what if we recognize vaping for what it is? A net improvement, a a nicotine delivery system that is healthier than cigarettes was, meaning that that using nicotine as a drug, because really that's what smoking and tobacco use is, is about. The cigarette was really just the delivery system for nicotine. If, if, if we're replacing that with vaping, then, well, that's a healthier public. And a healthier public maybe needs, well, fewer health bureaucrats. There's, I'm going to paraphrase something. It's called the Shirky Principle. And it's, it's a, a sort of, if you've heard of the Peter Principle, right, where people get promoted to the level of their incompetence, which means, you know, you keep doing a job well and you get promoted and you do that job well and you get promoted until you're finally in a position where you're not doing your job that well. And then that's where you're going to stick because you sort of reach the ceiling of your competence and you're not going to go any further. You're not going to be promoted any further. There's a there's a there's a variation on that called the Shirky principle, which is essentially that organizations that exist to solve a problem will eventually stop trying to solve that problem because They don't really have any incentive to solve the problem. If they solve the problem, they're out of work. Now, again, I don't want to go so far as to say that the the, anti-smoking, these health bureaucrats don't really want people to stop smoking or don't really want people to stop vaping. I think that they do. It's just that I, I, I think that they don't want to acknowledge that they're successful. I mean, because being successful for them means essentially working themselves out of a job. And I think a lot of them don't want to work themselves out of a job, which is why they're reticent to recognize the public health benefits that are vaping. Now, again, vaping is not healthy, and we have had sort of a Wild West atmosphere around vaping, which uh, there aren't a lot, there isn't a lot of standardization going on in the vaping community, so sometimes one vaping product to the next can be you know, wildly different levels of nicotine use. There have been some bad actors out there who maybe necessarily haven't been very good in the past about labeling their products or what have you. But for the most part, there's still a public demand for nicotine, like there are for a lot of drugs, alcohol, you know, all sorts of different illicit drugs, marijuana, cocaine, heroin. 
you know, some of those drugs have redeeming social value. Others don't. Uh, we can I probably go through on a case by case basis and have a debate about what ought to be legal, what ought to be illegal. But I think what we learned, like, for instance, with alcohol, which has huge social impacts, which has huge health consequences, we learned a lesson. We tried to ban it. It didn't work. People want it. And so our best bet is to just try to encourage people to use it responsibly and put in place you know, reasonable regulations that allow people to access alcohol how they want, but also recognizing that there's some risks. I don't understand why we can't do the same thing with nicotine. We are essentially trying to run a prohibition campaign against nicotine, and it's it's not working that well. I shouldn't say that. Uh, well, no, I, I will say that. It's not working that well. I don't think that the decline in tobacco really has anything to do with laws that are intended to force people into quitting smoking. Things like sin taxes, whatever. I don't think those sorts of policies work very well. I think what has worked well are public information campaigns. I think what has worked well is telling people, listen, smoking is dirty. It makes you feel bad. It gives you asthma. It gives you heart disease. It, it makes sure it gives you cancer. Right? It makes your lungs not work very well. Alerting people to those facts, I think, has led a lot of people to choose just not to smoke. Education works. And I am in favor of, of our healthcare bureaucrats, our, our health bureaucrats continuing to inform people about the risks of vaping. Because those risks are real. Vaping is not necessarily healthy. People should understand what that choice is. But beyond that, we should allow adults to make adult decisions. If you're 18 years old, you should be allowed to make a choice about vaping. You're allowed to make a choice about whether or not you want to join the military or enter into a contract or who to vote for or to get married or to buy a home or to do anything else. I mean, you can accumulate hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. You can exercise your voting franchise. You can have the government train you to go around the world and kill people, but you can't make a decision about vaping. Come on. I think we're always better served in society when we encourage people to make the right decisions rather than trying to force them to make the right decisions. Because if you put in place government bans, for the most part, people who want to vape, if you're 19 years old and you want to vape, you're going to vape. You're going to find a way to do it. You'll get away around the ban. And let's face it, we're not going to, we're not in a situation where we can, even if we wanted to, and even if we decided that it was good policy, that we could afford the sort of law enforcement resources it would take to go out there and and really get draconian with consequences for underage tobacco use or underage vaping. We're just not going to do that as a society, nor should we, even if we wanted to, and even if we could, and even if we had the resources, and even if we want to divert law enforcement from all the other things that they have to do to that sort of enforcement, we shouldn't want to. It's just not that big of a deal. So the consequences are going to remain low, and they should remain low, and therefore, generally, kids who are underage should smoke, and really, our best tools against that are parental vigilance and information campaigns to tell kids, hey, there are consequences. If you make this decision, if you choose to smoke, there are health consequences for this. If you choose to vape, there are health consequences for this, and these are what they are, and don't exaggerate them, right? Don't harm your credibility by by telling them outlandish tales about what's going to happen. Just inform them. This is what could happen. And if you make that choice anyway, then so be it. And as long as you're under your parents' roof, then I guess they're going to have some say in that. But once you're an adult, you're an adult, and you can make the sort of decisions that you want to. Because, oh, hey, by the way, we live in a free society, too. And if you want to eat cheeseburgers every day for every meal every day and drink, you know, a 24-pack of Coca-Cola every day and die when you're 35 years old from a heart attack or diabetes or something, well, I hope you don't do that. That sounds like a terrible way to go, but if you want to make those choices, well, so be it. It's a free country. That's it for my rant. My interview with Mr. Kuntz coming up next. This episode of the Plain Talk podcast is brought to you by Energy of North Dakota. Oil and natural gas from North Dakota strengthens all of America. And through our abundance of talents, innovations, and technologies, energy responsibly produced here translates to worldwide economic stability. With producers and our communities working together, we're securing a sustainable future that generation after generation can build on. It's all happening right now with Energy of North Dakota. Learn more at energyofnorthdakota.com. I am joined now by a gentleman by the name of Riley Kuntz. Riley is uh, has started a, a Facebook page called Audit the Swamp. 
and he is is part of a an effort to refer to the state ballot legislation that I've been talking about a lot on sayanythingblog.com and here on the podcast, uh, basically related to the powers of the auditor. Now, if, if you haven't caught up with this, essentially during the closing days of the legislative session, an amendment, a policy amendment, was made in the Appropriations Committee, which in and of itself is an unusual move because policy is not really supposed to be made in appropriations committees. There are policy committees, and then the appropriations committees are supposed to deal with fiscal matters, right? Policy matters are questions of, well, policy, what the law ought to be. Budget questions, fiscal questions are, well, how much how much money should we spend on the auditor? How much should the auditor make? How many employees should he have? How much is budgeted for those employees, et cetera, et cetera. So in the appropriations committee, they essentially amended the, the, the budget, and they included language that, requires the auditor to go begging to the in, in, it's a committee called the legislative audit and fiscal review committee to go there and ask permission for performance audits so it, it's not a good thing uh in fact it's a very bad thing i've been very critical of it in fact my, my sunday column was calling on the legislature to call themselves back into session to address this now the legislature can do that they have uh, they they are allotted 80 days per biennium per the state constitution to meet and legislate. Uh, they use 76 of those days during their regular session, so they can they do have the authority to call themselves back into session and use those remaining days, or alternatively, uh, the governor can call them back into special session any time. Um, now, today we actually had news, and I say today, we're recording this on Monday. You'll be hearing this on Tuesday, but we had news from state Senate Majority Leader Rich Wardner who essentially said that they are not going to call themselves back into session. So if we want to do something about this situation before the next regular session, which, you know, won't be until 2021, the beginning of 2021, basically two years from now, the referendum process is the only thing that that we can do at this point, which brings me to, after that lengthy uh, introduction to this issue, brings me to Mr. Koontz. Riley, how are you? Good. How are you? Tell me how this issue caught your attention. Well, it caught a whole lot of people's attention. Uh, <clears throat> you can't just go taking the, the power of the auditor away just because he's ruffling some feathers uh, by doing his job, which is exactly what happened here. And, and now that, that's that's what you think. Mean, certainly that's what I have written. That's what I feel happened. But you feel that way as well. You feel that this was retribution from the legislature, and I guess maybe even Governor Burgum, he signed this bill into law and, and certainly was aware of what he was doing. And in fact, uh, I will tell you that he preemptively sent me a statement uh, when he signed it into law. I didn't even have to ask him for a question. I think he knew it was going to be controversial. His his office sent me a statement about it. But that that's what you feel, Riley, is that this was retribution. This was the auditor was being aggressive, and now they crack down on him? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Governor Burgum has shown himself to be in the good old boys club. Numerous people have contacted him, uh, asking him to veto that, that item, but he chose not to. So, uh, yes, we are looking at the referendum process. Uh, not only this one, but also three other bills as well. Well, let's, let's focus for now on the auditor bill, because I think that's kind of the most pressing one that has the most people's attention. Um, where are you at in that process? Now, referring, just to help people out a little bit, referring, what we're talking about is, is referring the, the language in question that, 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 that limits the auditor's powers, referring that to the ballot. I think what most people are familiar with is the initiated measure process, which is essentially where you draft new legislation, you collect the signatures, and you put that on the ballot. What the referendum process is, is essentially the electorate exercising a veto. And so the, the electorate set is going to collect the signatures. It's the same amount of signatures. It's about, I think it's about 13,400 signatures. Uh, collect the signatures. And then you could choose some legislation that the legislature passed. And you say, we want to put that on the ballot and give the people a chance to veto it. It doesn't have to be an entire bill. Remember that this, uh, in fact, I, I had some confusion about that and had to go read the state constitution myself. And I got corrected by it by some, some folks on Facebook as well. But uh, you can even refer part of, of legislation. So this was part of the overall auditor's budget. You could select just the, the part in question and leave the rest of the budget alone. Um, now, Riley, there's a whole process to that, gathering signatures and everything. Tell us a little bit about where you're at in that organizing process. We are still gathering signatures um, or collecting affidavits. We have a whole bunch of people interested. 
um, there. It's it's quite a lengthy undertaking um, to do this. We've only really been going officially for a couple days, um, unofficially for about a week and a half. So yeah. I, now, have have you spoken to the Secretary of State's office? Have you filed anything with them? Not yet. No, I did ask them a question. I have a question about the campaign disclosure. Um, it's not quite there on the referendum process, so um, that's the only question I've asked them so far. Now, in in terms of um, you know, once you get it up and going, I mean, you you obviously have to make an official filing with the Secretary of State to, to, before you can get the petitions out there. But uh, there, there's a timeline on this where you have to get those signatures within. 90 days of the bill being filed. Now, the Secretary of State Al Jager told me that it was officially filed with his office on May 2nd. So I think by my math, you have till the end of July. I think it's July, about July 31st to collect 13,400 and some odd signatures. How are you going to do that? Well, there's a whole bunch of people um, willing to put in the legwork. So um, that's what we're banking on. Now, why, why do you, there- I'm sorry, go ahead. There's quite a lot of people who are very upset about this, so I, it, it's it's huge. This is a huge feat, but I think that we can reach it pretty easily. Do you feel like there's a – because I was surprised. I mean, I, I write about North Dakota politics for a living, and I zeroed in on this issue. Um, I, I saw when it passed in the House. I, I will tell you, it kind of blindsided me. And there were a lot of lawmakers, frankly, who said that they felt a little blindsided by it as well. Um, I, I, I guess we can have a debate about how – sympathetic we should be to that so those sort of arguments their job is to read the bills that they're they're voting on if they didn't sufficiently read it whose fault is that uh, i was surprised though by how many people were were looking at this i i sometimes write about a lot of obscure relatively obscure relatively down in the weeds issues dealing with the legislature and sometimes it's just kind of the gadflies that are paying attention right just kind of the political junkies that are paying attention this really does seem, though, as though it has it has grabbed the public's attention uh, more so than than I I frankly expected. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good. Uh, yeah. This is a very important issue, and it's um, it's really catching fire for sure. Our page has got 500 likes, and that's only like I said in about a week and a half. Why do you think this has caught so many people's attention? I mean, is is there an atmosphere in North Dakota? You think that that this just was like the the straw that broke the camel's back for a lot of people? Why why do people care about this? Yeah, uh, that's a good point. I think so. So this should be pretty obvious that we're looking for transparency. We know what's going on. There's some stuff going on that we don't like. We voted on Measure One to establish the Ethics Commission. Uh, that kind of turned out to be a fiasco, but. I think we, the people, were trying to tell the legislature we don't really like what's going on and hope for some things to change. Now, the auditor is doing a tremendous job and and bringing uh, hard-to-find information to us, and we want that to continue. I, I agree with you. I, I think I think Mr. Gallion, Josh Gallion, he's a Republican. He's he's held that current office since 2016. I think he's been doing a tremendous job. I think he's been aggressive. I think it's been a... a I think what's got a lot of people riled is is he's taken a much different approach to that office, and I'm not necessarily running down his predecessor, Bob Peterson, but Josh has come in, and he's been aggressive, and I think it's been a breath of fresh air. I think it's a good thing, uh, but I think I think you're right. I think it has ruffled some feathers. I will tell you, Riley, I, I didn't support Measure 1. I think Measure 1 is deeply flawed policy, but I do think Measure 1 tapped into a feeling that a lot of people in North Dakota have which is that the lawmakers sometimes aren't paying as much attention as they should be uh, or or are a little bit out of touch. And, and then frankly, I think a lot of it is sometimes the legislature doesn't do a good enough job of explaining what they're doing or communicating what they're doing. There's a, how, however you want to explain it, I think there's a trust gap that, that's growing between the public and the legislature. Would you agree? Absolutely. Well, not just the legislature, the general government as, uh, as a whole, yeah. Why do you think it's happening? I don't know. I would like to know, but I I could speculate all day, and it really doesn't get you anywhere. Yeah. Well, Riley, uh, if for people who want to find out more, because I, I imagine that you're going to want volunteers from all over the state to help collect signatures, how do people follow the progress you're making on this issue? Like if they want to go to a place to, to follow along, to stay up to date, to volunteer in one way or another if they want to, how do they find out more information? 
Uh, the best and really only place is on Facebook at Odd at the Swamp. Uh, get a hold of somebody, message, post, and we'll respond as quickly as we can. Okay. Riley, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Nice talking. That is it for today's Plain Talk podcast. A little note on the schedule for new podcasts coming out. Uh, Mondays may not always have a new podcast during the summer. It's just political news uh, for, for Say Anything blog gets a little slow in the summer between the end of the legislative session and sort of the beginning of the the general election campaigns uh, towards the end of the year. So during the summer, a lot of Mondays, we may not have an actual new episode. I, I will still be doing my weekly appearances with Jay Thomas, so you'll see that bonus audio on Mondays. But sometimes on Mondays, there won't be a new episode. So if, if there's not one one day, don't don't get alarmed. Everything's okay. It's just uh, just sort of finding enough content to uh, to fill all the shows. Uh, if you ever have any feedback or you want to get in touch with me, or you're ever curious about what's going on or you want to talk to me about something that was on the show or if you have a complaint about how hard it was to listen or, or whatever, uh, email me, rob at sayanythingblog.com. If you're listening to this podcast on a platform that allows you to rate a review, if you would leave an honest rating and honest review that helps other people find the podcast, I would really appreciate that. You should follow me on social media. I'm at Rob Port on Twitter. Uh, I'm also on Facebook. Say Anything Blog is on Facebook and Twitter as well. These are very easy to find. If you would subscribe and follow, I would sure appreciate that. And thanks for listening. I really appreciate it. We'll talk again. <laughs>